that part. The Star Wars trilogy set a, stand for, a standard for special effects in movies and made Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Darth Vader, and Jabba the Hutt household names. Anyone who's anyone in the sci-fi world would know the name Forrest J. Ackerman. A science fiction actor turned fanatic has also uh, turned his own home into a memorabilia mecca. And he joins Jan Wall this morning to talk about his new book, Forrest J. Ackerman's World of Science Fiction. Good morning to both of you. Oh, good morning, John. Good morning, everybody. Forrest J. Ackerman, he knows all about the history of sci-fi. He was around for a lot of the greatest science fiction movies you can remember, including movies like The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Bride of Frankenstein. There was a time that science fiction was intelligent, as well as uh, the scary genre, too. So welcome, Forrest J. Ackerman. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Well, is it my imagination? You know, I just saw Starship Troopers, and I was terribly disappointed. Has science fiction gone downhill at all? It's dumbed down? Well, yes. It's a case of the special effects being the tail that's wagging the werewolf nowadays. And instead of having intelligent plots, where well, we just uh, have a lot of e explosions and, and incredible special effects, but uh, very weak in the plot lines. It's too bad because science fiction people love intelligence. And uh, that's very sorely missed. But fortunately, you have a lot of books and, of course, your, your museum. Let's go back to one of my favorite movies of all time. James Whale directed The Bride of Frankenstein. Yes. Now, explain why this was such an important film to the genre. Well, it was the sequel to the original Frankenstein, which I saw here uh, on Christmas Day at the Orpheum Theater on Market Street in 1931. And uh, four years later, due to the popularity of the original film, they... Uh, decided it was time for the monster to have a mate, and so uh, Elsa Lanchester became the bride of Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And it was some great music, some great moments. Uh, everything seemed to work in the Frankenstein genre, and you knew Boris Karloff, correct? Uh, I was in his company ten times in my life. One magic hour, every word that came out of his mouth, I had put into it. I wrote a Decca record album and was there when he recorded it. Mm -hmm. And was uh, you knew also Bella Lugosi. In fact, if we can show your ring, yes. let's see. This is a ring. Let me see if I can somehow get it on camera here. There we go. Bella Lugosi gave you this ring, right? It's a Dracula That's ring. Right. And I have one of the three capes I saw him wearing here in 1932 on the stage at the old Erlanger Theater. Wow. And was Bella Lugosi anything like the character in Ed Wood that we saw? No, no, no. He was a real continental gentleman. I knew him the last three years of his life. I never heard him say so much as a hell or a damn, let alone the scatological things they had him saying about Boris Karloff in the film, which was uh, just cheap shot. It got laughs, yes, but uh, it was not the real Bela Lugosi at all. Didn't walk with a cane. He never fought with an octopus. The, the whole film was virtually a fantasy. I don't know how they selected two young fellows who weren't even alive when Bela died to write the script. Mm -hmm. So Tim Burton didn't come to you with any asking you anything? No, uh, I was actually, I was Ed Wood's literary agent, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't exist in the film. Mm. Uh, pulp Fiction was a big film, and, and now people are talking about L.A. Confidential, the whole pulp magazine uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, are they popular once again, these pulp magazines? And you've written for them, haven't you? Well, we don't have pulp magazines uh, anymore. No, those were in the uh, 1930s and, and 40s were more or less the last of the, the pulp publications. Now we have the little more slick uh, pocketbooks and paperbacks. And yeah, but there's something fun about these. There have been a lot of movies made from great science fiction authors. For instance, how do you, how do you feel about The Time Machine? It was made by the H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells, yes. I, I met him in 1938. This great literary god came down from Mount Olympus and, and moved among us mortals. And uh, uh, actually, I can tell you how he sounded. I was expecting kind of a, a deep, booming, impressive Orson Welles. And I was quite surprised, a squeaky little voice that came out of this small, roly-poly gentleman. He said, I am going to talk to you for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, was that a successful uh, translation of his work, The Time Machine, the film? Uh, excellent, yes. And uh, another book that he did was called The Shape of Things to, to Come. Come. Yes, Raymond mm -hmm. Massey, I think, was right. in that film. <laughs> A very good one, an old one. You can Excellent. maybe get on video if you're lucky. Yes. Uh, what about a, a rather recent one, Blade Runner? Uh, yes. Did that one work for you on a sci-fi level? Yes, it did. And uh, I knew the author, Philip K. Dick, uh, before he passed away. And uh, there's a building in it called the Bradbury Building featured. 
and 105 years ago, my maternal grandfather was the architect of that building. Oh, man, that's amazing. You are so connected. I can't <laughs> stand it. Uh, a great cult favorite is Amazon Men on the Moon. That's one of those great ones that are so bad it's good. You, know, you can rent it and just have a ball watching it. Uh, you were involved in that film. There is no such film, hon. It's Amazon Women oh, on the Moon. Oh, sorry. Well, you know, I think about men, honey. What can I say? Amazon Women on the Moon. Yeah, I played uh, future president of the United States. Then in my next film, uh, Turkeys in Outer Space, I graduated. I became president of the world. And then after two terms, I was out of a job, and all I could get was to be a judge in Nudist Colony of the Dead. It was, it was quite a come down from president of the world. <laughs> it must be fun working on these movies. It sure I mean, is. I've been in, been in 52 of them. Ah, uh, sort of the trashier the better, or the yeah. tackier the better? Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. But speaking of the President of the United States, how do you feel about Independence Day, that recent film that has uh, kind of done wonderfully at the box office? Yes, well, uh, my heart bled for the dear late uh, George Pal, who made The War of the Worlds. I thought if he had only had all of these spectacular special effects in, in his time. Uh, what he could have done. Yes. Now, your memorabilia museum, at which is your home in L.A., mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about King Kong earlier, and I was saying I was so sad that the Lost World didn't have any heart to it. Right. I mean, the Spielberg Lost World. Uh -huh. Whereas King Kong had so much heart and soul. Uh, is that your feeling as well? Absolutely. I have the uh, Pteranodon in my home that was trying to fly away with Fay Ray. I got it from the brother of the late Rod Serling of Twilight Zone mm -hmm, fame, and it yes. arrived in a shoebox uh, in the mail, and I had to go to the nearest friend who would recognize my treasure. Unfortunately, his wife came to the door, and she didn't know anything about pteranodons. She went screaming to her husband and said, I think Mr. Ackerman is here with a dead crow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. She didn't know it's real memorabilia. Well, if you'd like to talk to Forrest Ackerman, and boy, is he amazing. So many stories. Knows everybody. Here's where you can see him. Forrest Ackerman is at the book signing and costume contest at the Booksmith tonight at 7 o'clock in San Francisco. For information, 415-863-8688. And he is an absolutely fascinating man. Forrest J. Ackerman, thank you so much for spending time with us. All right, John, and back to you, kiddo. Well, thank you both. And don't go away. Coming up, the director of the San Francisco Ballet, Helgi Thomason, joins us to talk about... The if you were a monster maven during the 50s, 60s, or 70s, there was only one person you could rely on for your infirmation. His magazine not only scared millions of boys and ghouls, but also inspired many of today's most respected writers and filmmakers. Today, he remains one of the horror industry's bleeding men. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Forrest J. Ackerman. I have only discovered as an adult how influential Famous Monsters of Filmland was. Wouldn't be surprised if... Uh... My real interest in movies, you know, serious interest in movies, started with that magazine. I don't think there's another person on the planet like Forey Ackerman. Um, the fact that he created famous monsters, that a uh, film land, which like I, I, think I used to live for. In Horrorwood, California, there lives a man known as the Sultan of Sci-Fi, the Master of Monsters, Doctor Acula. Forrest J. Ackerman. Who dares disturb the sleep of the vampire? Oh, I bid you welcome. Don't be afraid. Meet the Acker Monster, known to an entire generation of horror film fans as Uncle Forey, creator and editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. A magazine that made mothers cringe and made young boys who dreamt of monsters do anything to get it. My mother wouldn't let me have them in the house. I saw them at my cousin Scott's house, and I would, you know, read them voraciously, really pour over the... Because it was the only magazine out there that actually told you how it was done. Other magazines tried to imitate, but none had Forey's touch, his true love of science fiction. From the time the first issue of Famous Monsters hit the stand in 1958, through over 200 issues and beyond, the magazine and its creator became almost as famous as the Famous Monsters themselves. I get almost uh, daily reinforcement uh, letters from 
young men now in their 30s or so, they say, you made my childhood, and I just lived month for month for your magazine. And uh, these kids grew up, uh, well, one of them was 14 years old, a uh, man who now gets $10 million advances for books he hasn't written yet, but uh, Stephen King sent me his first story when he was 14. <laughs> And uh, all around me, little boys have grown up and turned out to be John Landis and George Lucas and uh, Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper and John Carpenter and Rick Baker, Monster Maker. I just recently was looking back through some of my old issues to try to find some pictures that I needed for reference for a makeup I was going to do. And it really brings back a, a funny feeling of the whole time of my life when I had these magazines memorized. I, I knew what was on each page in each issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland. And it took the subject seriously. I mean, it was it was funny, and it had a lot of puns in it, and it was written for an 11-year-old, which was great. But also, it had a tremendous amount of history in it. I mean, he, he legitimized a very sort of illegitimate kind of movie-making that was not, not taken seriously by anybody but the people who did it. And uh, I think that we all owe him a lot. Forty is important, and he's important historically. He's, uh, from the time he was a kid, with those other weird kids, Ray Harryhausen and Ray Bradbury, um, they had a very distinct vision of an appreciation of fantasy, not just as pulp, but as uh, a genuine literary or cinematic art form. I've got the president on the electro scan. John Landis has so much respect for Forrest Ackerman that he made him the president of the United States. Come in, men of Moon Rocket One. In his film, Amazon Women on the Moon. We read you, Mr. President. This is a proud day for all Americans. He did a much better job than the current president. For he's a natural. In fact, he's been in lots of films. It's sort of a payback for his inspiration of a generation and for being the ultimate science fiction fanatic. They're running low on liners. You think you can catch up? Don't worry. I'm keeping our spacemen happy, getting things squared away. While movie makers like Landis work to preserve Forey forever on film, he has continued to chronicle the history of horror films, even though Famous Monsters of Filmland is long gone. In the Acker Mansion, where the Acker Monster lives, is the greatest collection of monster, sci-fi, and horror movie memorabilia ever amassed. In 1926, when I was nine years old, the science fiction magazine jumped off the newsstand, grabbed hold of me, said, take me home, little boy, you will love me. From there it grew. Uh, three years after that, my mother was quite concerned. She said, son, do you realize how many of these magazines you have? And I said, no. And she said, well, I just counted them. You have 27. How can you imagine why by the time you're a grown man, you might have 100? At last count, Forrest J. Ackerman had 40,000 books, over 100,000 movie stills, hundreds of posters and autographs, and over 600 props, like the famous Dracula ring given him by his friend Bela Lugosi, and the mummy's ring, a gift from Boris Karloff. And then, there's his favorite girl. Ultima Futura Automaton, the Metropolis Robotrix. The original probably blown to bits in the Blitz of Berlin. But William Malone and Robert Short, over a period of a year and a half, reconstructed her for me. Well worth the 600 hours. He's been a science fiction fan all his life, and he's collected everything that ever came his way. I mean, if it was so much as a napkin that Boris Karloff used at a, at a, at a bar. And he's got it all in his house. Uh, and, and not only that, he lets people see it. I mean, he, he has tours. And he lets kids who rob him blind in and, and, and look at the stuff, you know. Um, I mean, he's a big kid. He's, he's, the, he's the biggest kid that I ever met. And, uh, and he, I hope he always will be. He's lurking at you, babe. <laughs> let's check back now with Steve and Linnea for another monstrous makeup. In the foothills below the famous Hollywood sign lives an unusual man in an unusual house. Just follow Forrest J. Ackerman downstairs to the basement. Well, there are 300,000 things. Maybe I know where 299,000 are. He calls it Acker Mansion. 
17 rooms filled with books, memorabilia, movie props, and artifacts, all about science fiction and horror. His first acquisition? This very copy of Amazing Stories magazine that 10-year-old Forey bought in 1926. By 1949, he was known as Mr. Science Fiction, the world's leading authority of the genre. This is Bela Lugosi's personal Dracula ring and Boris Karloff when he played Imhotep, the 3,700-year undead mummy, film with the same name. That was his scarab ring, so I'd always keep Karloff and Lugosi close together as they were in half a dozen films. As publisher of Famous Monsters of Filmland, Ackerman has brought horror to America's heartland for 30 years. Numbering in his vast fan club, such names as Spielberg, Lucas, and Landis. And here's Stephen King's first story that he sent me when he's 14 years old. Of course, I tried to dissuade him from being a writer, you know, I said, no, no, no talent there, you know. Shortly before Metropolis filmmaker Fritz Lang died, Ackerman accompanied him to a film festival in Brazil. And they showed Metropolis, and Fritz and I were sitting in the front row, and they asked him to come up on the stage and make comments about it. Well, instead of that, he rose, he put his arm on my shoulder, and he said, anything you want to know about Metropolis, ask my friend Forey Ackerman. He knows more about it than I do. <laughs> Forey rates the original Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney as the best horror film he's seen, and he claims he's seen every one ever made. Any present-day creepy classics? I feel they've lost a lot, uh, sort of the, the tail wagging the werewolf nowadays in the, in the matter of special effects, that uh, think of those first and, and, and story last. I hope we'll get back to first principles one of these days. When you think you've seen it all, Forey dons Lugosi's cape from the original Dracula and heads for another haunt. I bid you welcome. It's called Grizzly Land, where Ackerman displays his most grisly props and artifacts. 365 days a year, a little house of horrors. The man who coined the term sci-fi responds to hundreds of letters from around the world each month. No one else has the answers. There are six clubs that all use the term sci-fi. Of course, in various parts of the world, sometimes they call it Sifi, and sometimes it's Skiffy, but even Skiffy is Spiffy. And Forrest J. Ackerman thought it was spiffy when he was recently inducted into the Horror Hall of Fame, receiving this Grim Reaper Award. Meantime, this 76-year-old little boy is content to pat around the 17 rooms he calls Acker Mansion. This is Don. Maybe in 1958, what day was it? February. February, 1958, mm -hmm. you were walking past the newsstand, you see, and you had 35 cents in your hot little hands, and you didn't know what to do with it, and you saw this cover. Right. And you said, I've got to have her. And then the monster wasn't too bad either. And you said, and you bought this, and you stuck it away in a drawer someplace, and you still have it. You're very fortunate, because this is issue number one of famous monsters we have with us today, tonight, tonight, I greet you, I'm so proud, I'm so happy, I'm so ecstatic, uh, well, I'm also glad that we have with us Forrest J. Ackerman, who was the, the founder and public editor, and I mean, you, this is your baby. Yes, I, I was the founder, I found it right there in my typewriter. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> and, you know, and, and it, amongst other things, I mean, uh, famous monsters is really just a a, a fairly late thing in your career. You, 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 you encompass so, the whole genre. I, mean, I, I go back to 1922 when I was five and a half years old. One glorious night I saw a film called One Glorious Day and that was the beginning of my activity in the world of fantasy. And you started collecting things, I understand, until your mother was ready to throw you or something That's else That's right. House. My gosh, when I was 12 <laughs> years old, she was so concerned. She says, son, do you realize you have 27 of these magazines? Why, by the time you're a grown man, you might have 100. Well, mother made it to nearly 94, and my 18-room home and three garages in which couldn't park a pogo stick are now filled with 300,000 books and magazines and paintings and props. And Is there anything missing from your collection? Yes, if anybody out there within the sound of my voice has a first edition 1818 of Frankenstein, I'd be very happy to have them add that to it. I have 200 different Frankensteins, but I'm still missing that very first edition. Great. Well, now, it, 
Vivian, this collection brings you here to Washington Island. Mm -hmm. Why are you here, not here in Creature Feature, I don't know why you're here in Creature Feature, but <laughs> due to your poor taste, I'm sure. <laughs> but why are you here in Washington? Well, there's a traveling exposition that's been uh, created. It's going all around the country for the next couple of years. I understand it's getting so popular, it may even go outside the country, Japan and Germany and various places want it. It's called Hollywood Legend and Reality. And I've kind of contributed to the irreality of it. I have a big poster there from uh, called the Phantom Empire with Gene Autry about a civilization 10,000 feet under the under the uh, surface of the of the earth. I was going uh, to interrupt you because yeah. I don't think a lot of people realize that Gene Autry did science fiction. Mm -hmm. They think of the strumming yeah. singing cowboy, you know, I'm back in the saddle again, but he actually did Well, for that. 13 weeks, yes. He was uh, there in Murania with uh, the robots. And then also uh, Ray Harryhausen is the great animator of dinosaurs and mythological creatures. He destroyed the Washington Dome at one time with a flying saucer and Earth versus the flying saucers and have the model. Okay, and at which point uh, we'll, we will show you later that mob, we have the, the scene, the destruction scene of that mob. I just, I, I, I guessed that. Okay, very, very sharp. We are going to ask, and we're going to activate our not quite so dead brain here. It looks pretty dead to me in just a little bit, but right now, let's get back to our film. again on Creature Feature. With us is Forey Ackerman. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I'm trying to come up with a title that I could, that I could, I could put upon you. Oh, Mr. Monster, perhaps. Okay, on this. Mr. Monster. Okay. okay. You have brought with you, you're wearing, as a matter of fact, this, this lovely ring here. Can we get a tight shot of this ring? Now, tell us a little bit about it. Yes, well, this uh, was created for Bela Lugosi, Mr. Count Dracula himself. Uh, he wore it in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. It's also been seen upon the hand of the late Lon Chaney Jr. And I made a point of having Christopher Lee wear it and Barbara Steele and uh, Boris Karloff uh, laid a finger upon it one time when he was making his final four films. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that has been handled by many of the outstanding personalities in the horror genre. Now we have this, this, this Dracula statue right here. Yes, also. Bela Lugosi had 25 of these made uh, at the time he was still living in Hungary by an outstanding sculptor there. He was down to the last three at the time I met him. I knew him the last three years of his life and was at his funeral. So uh, he let me have that when there were just three left. Now who, who are some of the big stars that you've gotten to know over the years? Uh, I was in the company of Boris Karloff on ten occasions in my life. Uh, one magic hour, every word that came out of his mouth I had put into it. I did a Decca record album called An Evening with Boris Karloff and mm. his friends. And I've known uh, Elsa Lanchester, the bride of Frankenstein, and Bobby Brzee, who's a new cult queen coming up fast, kind of in the footsteps of uh, Barbara Steele. Since mm. she's retired, she did about 20 of the horror films. I uh, knew Fritz Lang very well, the man who uh, did Metropolis and Woman in the Moon and discovered Peter Lorre and put him in M as the child murderer. Uh, I met Lorre on the set of The Raven. And I uh, particularly very well know a marvelous gentleman, uh, Vincent Price. We've been regarded oh. sometimes as uh, kind, of, uh, kind of twins. As a matter of fact, we were together in a hotel in Madrid when he was uh, head of the Fantasy Film Festival there, and I was immediately mistaken for his brother. I and mean, I uh, see the uh, resemblance there, yeah. I, I think if we'd only had a tape, uh, he and I were revving along 120 kilometers an hour in a car going out to where Cervantes had, had written, uh, uh, what's that, windmill? Don Quixote. Right, Don Quixote. I don't know whether he, he wrote Don Quixote. I don't know whether Don Quixote wrote back or not. But <laughs> in any event, Vincent and I were, were revving along. And of all, oh, can you imagine what in the world we were doing a du duet on Al Jolson's Sonny Boy? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about, you, you say, the, the brain that, that wouldn't die. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. Bra the brain. I don't, why wouldn't the brain die? I mean, doesn't it know that a, that a blonde brain has more fun than a, than a brunette? Uh, why it wouldn't die, really? I, I don't uh, know. Maybe it never met, met maybe, uh, maybe it didn't meet, meet me squirrel. <laughs> you got me tongue-tied. <laughs> Speaking about the brain, yeah. brain, we, we act, brain, uh, hello, brain. Hey, you, hey, hey, you, brain. hey, watch we, it, we, watch we, it. We, we got it, we got it. Do you have hey. any... Hey, watch it, fella. Don't tap me like that. Oh, uh, why? Are you sensitive? Of course. Hey, look. You... Now we even get into that. Where do you come from? What do you mean, where do I come yeah, from? Yeah, what do you do for a living? 
or did you do for a living? Well, I uh, I can't really talk about it a lot, but I worked at the Pentagon. No, oh, that must explain why it's so small. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. I thought it was son of Donovan's brain, yeah, maybe. Good, good. Uh, you got any questions for Mr. Ackerman right now? On uh, yes, Earth? as a matter of fact, I do. Would you step away, please? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Okay. Ackerman, what's, what's the real story on Bella, Bella Lugosi, that is? Bella's role in Plan 9 from Outer Space. Well, that was a posthumous role. They had uh, shot just a few scenes of him wandering around in a graveyard, and then they got the notion after he had died of making this uh, film and so they resurrected uh, what little footage they had on him and then they got a, a kind of a look-alike who spent the rest of the of the film uh, holding uh, the cape up in front of him so that theoretically he couldn't tell the difference but Bala never lived to, to see any of the footage on that or realize that he got the Golden Turkey Award as the, oh, was, the, was the most horrifying horror <laughs> film of all time. Was he planned this, to, to do this role? Uh, I believe so. They had a couple of more films lined up for him. Uh, oh, The Ghoul Goes West or something like that and uh, in Plan 9. But uh, say he... Uh, I was with him uh, two weeks uh, before he went into the, the, the final Black Sleep at the preview of a picture called The Black Sleep. And, uh, he never lived a complete Plan 9. Okay. I know we could go on and on and on. Unfortunately, we have to go back to this movie we're showing tonight. Maybe we'll talk to him. Get... get get uh, Forty's opinion on tonight's movie. We, <clears throat> maybe we shouldn't. Let's go back to the brain that wouldn't die. We'll be back in a little bit. During the movie, the brain that wouldn't die on the TV set didn't die. Ours did. He went back to the Pentagon, I think. Oh, well. We'll discombobulate him, take him away, and... Uh, anyone want him for what? Never mind. Mm. Oh, excuse me, mummy. Mummy, mummy. Yes, mummy. Yes, you have a question for Mr. Ackerman. <laughs> ah, mummy wants to know in your collection, do you collect movies? I uh, collect video cassettes nowadays, yes. What is your all time favorite movie? Well, I'd say in the horror field, if you give me two choices, uh, one in the silent would be Lon Chaney as the Phantom of the Opera. And uh, in the beginning of the talking era, I think uh, it's never been surpassed uh, Boris Karloff's rendition of the Frankenstein monster. Yeah, either in Frankenstein or The Bride of Frankenstein. Which do you like better? Uh, the original. Uh, original? Mm -hmm. How about in the area of science fiction? Metropolis, definitely. I just saw it for the 77th time in Berlin recently. Now, which version? The original or the re recreation? Uh, well, I worked with uh, Giorgio Moroder on the recreation, but it was that version I saw there. And uh, the young uh, hero of it was staying in our hotel, now 83 years old, Gustav Freerlich. Whatever happened to the, to, the, to the robot from the film? Do you have it? Uh, it was probably blown to bits in the Blitz of Berlin. Nobody really knows what became of it, but uh, two young chaps in Hollywood spent a year and a half and 600 hours and reconstructed her for me. Oh, dogs running around, I don't know. Okay, we've got some upcoming movies. We won't even talk about tonight's film, because everybody already has their opinion of tonight's film. we got some new film or mm -hmm. films coming up next week. We've got Assignment Terror with Michael Rennie. Now, you, you were talking about that a little while ago. That's, you know a little bit about that. Yeah, I think uh, because it uh, had a similar title to one I was in called Dracula versus Frankenstein. I think it was called Frankenstein versus Dracula, so it sounds to me like this uh, Italo... Uh, German film has been given an American title. I think he was the only one who actually spoke English, and the rest was Saint Den. Yeah, his 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 mouth does meet the uh, the, the things. Uh -huh. Okay, that's assignment terror. Now, blood and lace. Have you ever heard of that? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, so that's the kind of program you said. Well, I'll be back. Blood <laughs> and lace. <laughs> Never mind the lace. <laughs> well, hey, look. But also may have some roller derby queens on too, but that's besides the point. Okay, I want you to look, we have a clip from another upcoming film. I want you to mm -hmm. watch this clip here and see if you can tell me a little bit about this movie here. Uh, let's, let's, can we look at this movie clip here of an upcoming film here? Oh, oh, you've been doing your homework. That's bad Dr. Beaumont there. <laughs> like my twin, Dr. Acula. Uh, we just happen to have the film in stock, and uh, 
Was it, was it fun making that one? No, absolutely not, because I was suffering. I had my arm in a sling. They called up and said, you want to be killed by the Frankenstein monster? I said, no, I think I'll sit this one out. And they said, no, no, something new has been added. The monster's been bitten by Dracula. He's a vampire. He'll just fang you to death for a hundred bucks. So I thought, <laughs> okay. Uh, but when the time came, they spent 12 hours trying to get the goop on the monster's face, and it kept falling off. <laughs> Dracula had to be on the Red Eye Express back to New York for a play the next day. So finally they said, even if the makeup falls off in front of the camera, we got to do it. <laughs> so then they went to put the fangs in. No room for the fangs. They said, sorry, we got to just uh, squash Ackerman to death. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what I didn't want. And what you saw there, that wasn't acting. I was really trying to get away from the six-foot, six bruiser. And my great death scene, I say, ever since I was five and a half, I've been watching people dead on the screen, and they never fooled me. I always saw a little breathing going on. So there I'm smashed down on the asphalt, holding my breath, determined to give an Academy Award that nobody is going to say, I didn't look dead. Well, the director forgot to call cut. <coughs> he just walked away and left me there. And, <laughs> and I was holding my breath and holding my breath, and I thought, God, I must be brown, I must be blue, I must be polka dot by now. And finally, my dear wife heard her whisper, well, what's the matter with my husband? Why doesn't he get up? So someone came over and tapped me. Are you okay, Mr. Ackerman? <gasps> yes! <laughs> thank God it wasn't rehearsed, or I might not be on Creature Feature today to tell the tale. <laughs> and the worst part is, they don't show you laying there. No, no. <laughs> you go, whoop, uh, that's right. it. <laughs> We're going to have more. I, as a matter of fact, there's another story I think we can find out about, a little bit more about. But right now, let's get back to the brain that wouldn't die. We're talking with Forty Ackerman, who's Mr. Monster, and you, you've starred in how many different movies, or been in how many different movies? I've been in about 20 and I'm going to do seven so far this year. Now, we we're, were saying you were actually in the Michael Jackson video? Yes, yes. If you'll recall, there's a sequence where uh, he and his girlfriend are in the theater. She gets frightened of the werewolf. She says, I, I got to get out of here. She leaves. He leaves. That left two empty seats, and John Landis had deliberately got me out of bed at 12.30 after midnight to come down and sit there in a red shirt and reprise a role I'd done 13 years years earlier for him eating popcorn in schlock. Well, he was uh, so enthusiastic about my role in Michael Jackson's Thriller that I graduated in his next film, Into the Night. I was there eight and a half minutes eating cheesecake. <laughs> And then I was told that in his next picture, an untitled one, that I would have a real, quote, juicy roll. So knowing a sense of humor, I figured, well, I'll be seen eating watermelon. watermelon or something like that. Yeah. Instead of that, it turned out to be President of the United States in a sort of a film within a film. The main film is untitled, but the, the film you'll see on TV is called Amazon Women on the Moon with Sybil Danning. <laughs> And uh, yes, it I'm, like a I'm uh, it was theoretically made in 1950, so I'm playing president of the United States in that far distant year of 1980 with the governors of all 48 states uh, <laughs> were wel welcoming the first man on the moon. <laughs> you, uh, you, you're, you're really no, not an actor, though. You're, you're no, primarily a, a writer. That's right, yes. I sit 25 hours a day at a typewriter or wiggling my fingers, but uh, a lot of young chaps that were... I brought Halloween to the kids of the country every month for about 25 years, and those kids have turned out to be the likes of Steven Spielberg and Stephen King and George Lucas and John Landis, and now that they're making their own movies, why they like to have me, for old Lang Syne's sake, uh, do a, a part in the picture. King! Now hold. Yes, Mom. Yes, Mommy. Mm -hmm. Ah, for all those... Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. For all those video fans, Yes. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. Mommy, please. Let me ask. For all those video fans, though, who, who are out there and they go to the video store and, mm -hmm. and pick out, can you list the, list the movies that you've been in so they can go look for you? Well, there's some I know that they can find at the end of something called Sleaze Mania Strikes Back. Uh, I, I do a bit in Beach Blanket Blood Bath. Don't try to say that fast. Beach Blanket Blood Bath. Blood bath. <laughs> and um, in The Howling, The Time Travelers, Dracula versus Frankenstein. That's one we just saw. Curator of the last museum on Earth after World War III has destroyed civilization in a film called Aftermath. And there's one that really went to my head. It's a picture called Scalps. Mmm. That was the joke. It was the, mm -hmm. the scalp. You know, it went, <laughs> went to my head. <laughs> I think I'm going to let you do the show, and I'm going to go. <laughs> hey, we, we got to go back to the movie for a little bit. We'll have more of Forty Ackerman after some more of the brain. 
Lugosi, I assume. I don't know just what the five is. But, uh, <laughs> Lugosi five? Yeah. We're back with Flory Ackerman. I've got to ask you this question. Yeah, you were talking about your, some of your favorite movies. I understand, though, at one time in the not-too-distant past, you put together a list of the ten worst movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them turned out to be American International, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I think you're confusing me with uh, Joe Dante. When he was a kid around 13, he sent in his 50 worst films, and I call it Dante's Inferno, obviously. Uh, about 25 years later, either the uh, producer had forgiven or, or forgotten because he gave him a chance to make Piranha, and he was off and running, and then, one of the uh, better-known genre directors now in Horrorwood, California. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yes. Uh, the other question I have is, I understand that you also did an appearance on the Murder of Griffin show that was kind of, that had, it was kind of an experience. Yes, he, uh, he asked me to bring a number of uh, objects on. Uh, I was wearing Bela Lugosi's Dracula cape on that evening and had some of the creatures, uh, the models from King Kong, and uh, I have life masks of Karloff and Lugosi and Cheney Jr. and Laurie. I was demonstrating them. And uh, nothing unusual happened? Nothing unusual? No. I gotta talk to Bob about this. <laughs> Someone suggested to ask that question. He says, oh, you gotta, you gotta have him tell you the story about when he was on Merv Griffin. I don't recall that anything unusual happened. No. Where's the phone? I wanna call Murder. <laughs> yeah, I'm Murder. That's Bob. <laughs> I'm a pal Bob Madel. All right, Bob. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll blow that one away. All right. How do you feel about contemporary versus classic films? Oh, I'm much more in favor of the, the classics. I'm afraid they've got a little too gory and, and uh, bloody for, uh, for my taste at the present time. It's, it's a triumph, I know, of the makeup artists, and I feel very happy for them that they got a lot of work nowadays, but uh, I really prefer the old-fashioned scares of uh, Cheney Sr. and Karloff and, and Dracula when it was done without so much gore and blood. Good. I agree with you. I definitely agree with you. I like blood where it mm. belongs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, current projects, what you up to? Other than Touring, touring Washington and looking at the monuments and so forth? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm uh, doing four autobiographical books, turning back the clock to 1958 when it all began and spawned all of these monster magazines and movies. Uh, I'm uh, looking over the very first issue of Famous Monsters and the second and the third and, and covering 50 issues at a time. There'll be four volumes where I uh, check out the first appearances of Spielberg and Kingham uh, Stephen King, for instance, sent me a story when he was 13 years old. I should have got him when he was still cheap. He got ten million dollar advance for two books he hasn't written yet lately. <laughs> but he doesn't need an American uh, Express card. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm having, uh, I have a lot of fun. I say, uh, reliving a quarter of a century or so ago, issue by issue. Now your 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 collection is open to the public, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, any Saturday afternoon that I'm home, obviously I'm not home. This Saturday, I'm 3,000 miles away, and I haven't been cloned yet, so we'll since there, there yes. aren't two of me. But when I'm home, I've had as many as 72 school gets turn up in, in buses, and I had uh, 65 Japanese fans at one time, and they come from all around the world. I'm happy on a Saturday afternoon to take them down to Grizzly Land and uh, <laughs> show them all the horrifying it. things I've collected. Now, one very important, this very serious question, because one, one of the fans said, what's going to happen to this collection when you pass on? Well, if I can't take it with me, I'm not going to go. What do you, what I love it. <laughs> I mean, when I pass on, where am I going to pass on? Oh, I don't to? know. Well, the great movie studio in the sky. <laughs> yes, well, uh, seriously, uh, I offered it all, the 300,000 pieces, to the city of Los Angeles, gave them about five years to show me some empty shelves and a place for posterity. Nothing came of that. So uh, there are about eight irons in the fire at the moment. The most serious seems to be an interest on the Queen Mary of all places. At least I don't think it'll ever be hijacked because <laughs> it's, uh, it's just there in dry dock. They have 60,000 square feet and uh, two decks that uh, are toying with the notion of possibly moving my collection and me. Uh, onto the ship, See, so we're, we're have the love boat. This could be the uh, uh, well, something went, boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got to go back to the conclusion of tonight's movie, and then we'll be back for some final words. Don't touch that dial. Forey Ackerman will be back with closing words in just a few more commercials. We're 
back for our final closing comments from our guest, Mr. Monster, Forrest J. Ackerman, who's visiting us from Hollywood, except he's here, but he came from Hollywood, or Los Angeles, or somewhere around there, on the West Coast. He was responsible, by the way, for the lovely young lady who happens to be in the lid of my coffin. Ah, Vampirella. Now, Vampirella, yes. yes. Tell, very quickly, tell us a little bit about Vampirella. Well, flying down to Rio de Janeiro in 1969, a plane load of incredible personalities. There was Roman Polanski, A.E. Van Vogt, Robert Block of Psycho fame, the late George Powell, who gave us the time machine and his uh, star, Yvette Ninia. Lightning was flying around the plane. I was looking down at the Amazon River. The hungry piranha were jumping up, hoping to get a free <laughs> meal in case we crashed. And having nothing better to do, I dreamed up Vampirella and her twin sister, Draculina, and the planet Draculon, where the rivers flowed with blood. And uh, so she survived in over a hundred uh, comic books. Was, was, there was a movie planned for that, wasn't there? Yes, there was. Uh, there were five scripts done on it, and then they uh, bethought themselves of the creator, turned it over to me to, to polish it, but nothing ever came of it. It's a shame. She, I'd love to have seen her come to reality. Mm -hmm. In more ways than one. We're out of time, Mr. Ackerman. I want to thank you very much. Well, are we going to do the theme song? Uh, the theme song? Yes. Uh, uh, Which theme song is that? Brain drops falling on your head. Next week on Feature Feature, we're going to bring you Assignment Terror with Michael Rennie. We're going to get into the psychedelic era with that one. It was sort of like Drag vs. Frankenstein, too, a psychedelic. Yeah. Thank you. See you next week. Los Angeles, wherein resides the master of them all, the evil intelligence that broods over their activities, Dr. Acula. I lose more cleaning ladies this way. For 55 years, Forrest Ackerman, known as Forey to friends and monsters alike, has been into horror, science fiction, and fantasy. I was riding around in the car in 1954, had the radio on, something was uh, mentioned about hi-fi, and since science fiction is always on the top of my tongue, the notion of sci-fi rolled right off it. Oh, Forey, I didn't recognize you without that mask on. Oh, well, I, I just use that for a disguise when I go out shopping so I won't be recognized by all my fans and get mobbed. Well, it did look pretty inconspicuous, I guess. What was that, anyway? Oh, I uh, was an alien astronaut when I wore that in a pilot for TV called Starstruck. Science fiction, in this case, means a collection reported to be worth over $10 million. This figure translates into over 300,000 items of every imaginable description. There's this uh, latest acquisition for my museum. It's the uh, Dr. Cyclops helmet. And also from uh, 1919 animated film, a forerunner of the Lost World and King Kong, and it's called The Ghost of Slumber Mountain. This is the arm that was detached from the body of the bloodthirsty carrot that menaced an intrepid band of earthlings in The Thing. And this, Desiree, is a Boris Karloff poster for The Devil Commands. You might say it was a seance fiction film because it was about ghosts. Here we have all that's left of that naughty bloodsucker Nosferatu after the vampire hunters had dispatched him to his just reward. Bela Lugosi was the original Dracula in the American version, although the German Nosferatu preceded it by several years. From Lugosi's own collection, the black cloak that was worn in the movie, the script from the play, and the original Dracula ring that Lugosi wore on the set. You are a wise man, Van Helsink, the one who has lived but a single lifetime. You know, the only thing about a collection like this is, um, what do you do when the lights go out? There are only capes and masks and things. This is Desiree Goyette at the Acker Mansion because Jim Healy, you asked for it. Ah, uh, this is W.C. Fields. Ah, good heaven. I have much scarier things than that around my place. Ah, uh, my wife. My mother-in-law, my children. 
I love children after properly cooked. <laughs> Five thousand members of KQED. Tonight, Video West looks at the dreams and the dreamers of science fiction. We'll talk to Robert Silverberg, Fritz Lieber, and Ray Bradbury about their work and see how some speculative views have been incorporated into our popular culture through the medium of the science fiction film. The director of The Day the Earth Stood Still, Robert Wise, will share his insights on how Hollywood has entered outer space, and Gene Roddenberry will reflect on the alternate worlds he created in Star Trek. Later, we'll also see how the world of super technology has turned some of the dreams of science fiction into a practical and occasionally frightening reality, as Video West looks at the images and the imagination of science fiction. He's been an animal who looked beyond his cave, his farm, and his home into the endless possibilities of what might be. It took the wedding of technology to those dreams to create the literature of science fiction. And during the late 1800s, that marriage produced classic extrapolations of what might happen when imagination became reality. As the 20th century cascaded onward, fiction occasionally ran a poor second to reality, and the dreamers were forced to journey further and further away from Earth to keep ahead. There have been instances when the technology has in itself become a form of visionary expression and the dreams of science fiction have been projected onto the movie screens and into the minds of an eager audience. The science fiction film has been around for most of the century and has managed to reflect the times that created them, reaching their quantitative peak in the post-atomic world of the 1950s. One man who pioneered the genre by keeping the stories basic and the budgets absurdly low was Roger Corman, and he has some thoughts as to science fiction's popularity during the 1950s. During the 50s, we were in a time of great economic and intellectual advancement in the United States. Coming out of the Second World War, the United States emerged as the most powerful country in the world, both economically and probably for the first time intellectually. So it was a country, I think, that felt it was on the leading edge of technology, was moving into the future scientifically, that we had the answers. And science fiction was a way to put the reader into the future to give him some sort of an answer or at least to give him some questions and maybe he could make those answers himself. 1951 was a time of plentiful gas, a police action in Korea, and the rise of Joseph McCarthy. And it also saw the production of what is considered to be one of the classic works of science fiction cinema, The Day the Earth Stood Still, a film directed by Robert Wise. Wise found the medium of science fiction to be a perfect vehicle for the conveyance of a social message, a message of peace at any cost that ran counter to the rather paranoid era that contained it. Thirty years later, Robert Wise reflects on science fiction's artistic license. You have much more freedom uh, in, in uh, dealing with science fiction because you don't have the set rules and the whole traditional thing to go to. And who knows what's up there? Who knows what a man from outer space who came down here to see us? Who knows what words might come out of his mouth? So I think, I think you have more freedom. I don't think it makes it any less important. I don't think the impact has to be any less, but I do think you, could, you can get away with more. 
Wise went on to make the Andromeda Strain, and perhaps his most creatively frustrating project, the movie version of Star Trek, a film that Wise thought... It had a lot going for it going in, uh, at least for those who, millions who followed the series and uh, were Trekkies, it had the, the set of characters and kind of situation. I don't know that I felt in the final analysis it was as evolving completely as I would like to have seen it be. But. That's the way it goes. The creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, has given a great deal of thought as to precisely what gave his creation such durability and its Trekkie converts such dedication and belief in its stories. Well, I, I think I stumbled onto a, a number of things that combined together to give it that, that power uh, that, that created the so-called fan phenomenon. One was, uh, uh, I, I am an optimist about the human future. I, I think we are wonderful, lovely creatures that have just begun inventing, just begun exploring. I, I've, I've always looked on the earth here, sort of our ancestral egg that we're going to hatch out of and, and leave it and go out and do things. And so the first thing I built in Star Trek was an enormous, uh, enormous positive, optimistic attitude that, hey, by the 23rd century, we've gotten rid of these uh, boundaries that, that divide us and the religious disputes and all of that we will have become one brotherhood on this planet and uh, and have turned our, our attention toward uh, space with great respect for life forms and the prime directive which says you do not interfere with the involvement of other life forms and all those things and I think to the young people who were our first fans we, we were first a big hit in colleges uh, these are very important statements to uh, to a young mind as a, as a matter of fact a young mind whether it's uh, 19 years old or, or 80 years old that uh, we're just beginning and it's great But before there were mega-budgeted science fiction film epics, there were the solitary dreamers, the authors being led down the path of alternate reality by tantalizing visions that they alone could see until they gave their dreams life by setting them down on paper. Fritz Lieber, one of the recognized fathers of modern science fiction, sees the evolution of the modern genre in chronological terms, beginning 50 years ago. Well, in the 30s, the, uh, it was, the literature was dominated by the dreams then of atomic energy and space flight and the, the robot. The 40s were the decade in which all this was, all the speculations, the major speculations came through were proven, were, began to be taken for granted. And the, the interest went back more to the behavior of people and societies. And the 50s, the, the interest turned more to the individual and to the, the possibilities of doom. During the 60s and 70s, there were the, the doom possibilities proliferated because, of course, doom by overpopulation and by, uh, by a, ruining, a ruining of the ecology. The 80s, I'd say, a, a continuation of interest in, in grow, of growing interest in different lifestyles, which has begun in the 70s. See, the science fiction writer can think of lifestyles not only in terms of human beings, but alien species of all sorts, and it kind of broadens the, the picture and allows you to explore other possibilities. science fiction has expanded in both content and popular acclaim. If any one person could be considered the subject's greatest fan, it would have to be Forrest J. Ackerman, better known as Mr. Sci-Fi. 
He's a collector, a literary agent for numerous authors, and all-around monomaniac for the genre. And it all started with that fateful pulp magazine cover. Well, this wasn't the first issue of Amazing Stories. It began in April 1926, but it was the first one that I saw just a few months later in October. And that really turned me on. I saw this critter, and I said to my tiny little mind that, gee, I wonder what that crustacean is all about. And then I got inside and uh, was taken to other worlds by H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and Edgar Rice Burroughs and Poe, and I was, I was off and running. I was bitten by a, a typical bug-eyed monster and never recuperated. Forey lives in the Acker Mansion, located in Southern California. It's his home and museum for innumerable books, paintings, and movie mementos. Well, I'd like to introduce you to my permanent house guest, Ultima Futura Automaton. She's the robot tricks from the great classic Metropolis. <laughs> We have the Golden Gate Bridge from Ray Harryhausen's It Came From Beneath the Sea. You know, that's the picture where they use the quintupus because he charges $10,000 a tentacle and they could only afford five, so they, they couldn't have an octopus, they had a quintupus. <laughs> and the gas bomb that brought down King Kong. There is the Metaluna mutant from the classic film This Island Earth. Life masks up there, Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, there's myself when I was alive. And don't let anybody ever tell you there ain't no Zanty Claws, because there they are right before your very eyes. That's a Zanty misfit. Forrest Ackerman is the keeper of the flame. Science fiction has always been his life's inspiration, and for him, it's the best way to live the future. During the 1960s, a so-called new wave of science fiction writers made a sizable impact on the medium, exploding what had become a cliched form of literary expression with works dealing with the human impact of technological expansion. One stunningly prolific writer whose work grew with the times is Robert Silverberg, an author who believes that the science fiction story can occasionally become lost in space, leaving humanity in a convenient black hole of plot for plot's sake. Well, I think that the best fiction of any sort involves some uh, research into human or inhuman or, or non-human or alien behavior that what people turn to fiction for is not entirely uh, chess puzzles, but uh, vicarious experience and commentary and insight into other lives, which by extension becomes insight into their own. Science fiction, of course, has the, the intellectual game quality, too. Uh, and a lot of science fiction has no more character development to it than that brick wall does, in fact, rather less. But yet, the, uh, the lasting thing in a lot of the best science fiction, in very sneaky ways sometimes, is the uh, the characterization what comes out of those those movies and television shows that i was talking about i think the secret of of star trek is kirk spock and mccoy the stories are straightforward elementary science fiction some of them very entertaining some of them quite simple-minded but uh, roddenberry somehow tapped into uh, elemental archetypical structures with those characters and managed to make fairly sophisticated viewers as well as a whole horde of uh, baboons uh, care about Captain Kirk and, and Mr. Pointy Ears and the grouchy doctor. Uh, as in any kind of fiction, the, the ultimate secret is not gimmicks but characters. <laughs> Now that science fiction has made the transition from pulp paperback to college textbook, certain authors are receiving long overdue attention as serious literary figures in their own right. One such author is Ray Bradbury, a man who, through his work, has taken countless readers on poetic trips around the universe and through imaginary worlds uniquely his own. 
But when he is bound to Earth, Bradbury prefers to travel quietly from town to town by train, an experience that occasionally inspires him in some unpredictable ways. Going on the train up here, I was watching all the dogs in the, on the tracks and the boys going by and the birds in the sky, and I, I was full of cliché thinking. But it's relevant to the experience. I will never see that again, huh? That bird, that bush, that boy, that bike, this instant, I will never see again. There's no way of ever bringing it back. So for God's sake, pay attention. Don't let life slide by without tasting it and getting drunk on it and looking at it and touching it and enjoying every damn second of it because you're going to be dead forever. Bradbury's impressions of reality represent a unique vision, a vision that he has managed to capture on paper, and he has some thoughts on that creative process. Only, only fast work is good. If you slow down, you start intellectualizing and pontificating and being self-important and trying to influence your friends and please your relatives. So fast work is always the best work. There's one rule that applies to everything in life. Learn it and forget it. Mm -hmm. That's, you, you go through all the learning process, which can be slow at times. But once you learn a thing, you forget it. It's like playing the piano or typing a typewriter. You don't think how you're typing, you type. So thinking's got to be off somewhere else, and feeling, and living, and moving. So writing is the same as dancing, and, and painting, or conversing with friends, and surprising each other. So that's what you're trying to do here today. We're doing for one another where I don't know what you're going to ask me next. But if I slow down on you, beware, because I'm going to make up something. Huh? But as long as I keep talking this way, it's going to be good stuff. It's going to be honest. It's going to be direct. And if you don't like what I say, well, that's OK, because I take a chance on that by speaking the truth the way I see it. Bradbury's classic works such as Fahrenheit 451 and The Martian Chronicles have been categorized and analyzed for years. But how does the dreamer himself perceive his work? I'm an impressionist. I feel a strong kinship with, uh, with Monet and Manet and Renoir and the great impressionists because that's what they are. They were out to capture light and time. And they knew if they could do it right, they could crack your heart. And that's what I'm after when I write a book like Dandelion White. These are evocations of time. They're not representations of reality, but impressions of reality, which is something else again. of science fiction has both inspired and been inspired by the... I have much scarier things than that around my place. Uh, my wife, my mother-in-law, my children. <laughs> I love children uh, if they're properly cooked. 85,000 members of KQED. Video West looks at the dreams and the dreamers of science fiction. We'll talk to Robert Silverberg, Fritz Lieber, and Ray Bradbury about their work and see how some speculative views have been incorporated into our popular culture through the medium of the science fiction film. 
The director of The Day the Earth Stood Still, Robert Wise, will share his insights on how Hollywood has entered outer space, and Gene Roddenberry will reflect on the alternate worlds he created in Star Trek. Later, we'll also see how the world of super technology has turned some of the dreams of science fiction into a practical and occasionally frightening reality, as Video West looks at the images and the imagination of science fiction. He's been an animal who looked beyond his cave, his farm, and his home into the endless possibilities of what might be. It took the wedding of technology to those dreams to create the literature of science fiction. And during the late 1800s, that marriage produced classic extrapolations of what might happen when imagination became reality. Stars. Although bearing little resemblance to the flashy science fiction spacecraft, our own shuttle is the first big chance to get out of this planet and may be the key to human migration in outer space. If space triggers your imagination as much as it has the creators of science fiction and you can't wait for your turn on the shuttle, you might try, like Robert Truax, to outsmart NASA and go for the stars on your own. There she goes. It may be 500 years, it may be 100, only 100 years from now, but I predict that uh, one day there'll be more people living in space than are living on Earth. It's going to be a good place to live. Science fiction writers have conceived of every possible type of alien life form, from creepy monsters to trendy superheroes and just plain old humanoids with larger heads, ears, or cones. In reality, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is in its infancy, consisting of leafing through contradictory UFO reports, attempting to tune in to would-be signals from outer space with radio telescopes, or launching time capsules through space like bottles in the ocean. Meanwhile, we're also learning to communicate with other more down-to-earth alien civilizations using sign language with gorillas or music with dolphins. science fiction's most significant contribution to the culture has been to reflect present-day social conflicts and forecast their possible outcome under the safe cover of fantasy metaphors. From the naive visions of an orderly society ruled by happy white technocrats to the desperate negative utopias of 1984 and Brave New World, which sometimes rings so true nowadays, science fiction has taught a few lessons to the human race. But there's still room for the dreamers, and many of the depressing predictions that science fiction presents of the future are only just that, fiction. In Robert Silverberg's opinion... I think science fiction is terrible as prophecy. I think it has a dreadful record of predicting anything. Uh, it has a, a visionary value. It has a value for conditioning us against future shock. But its specific predictions are generally all wrong. It'll say there's going to be an atomic bomb, and then there is. Terrific. But it does not foresee well the consequences of these, these developments. Oh, sure. We're going to solve everything. I'm very, uh, I'm optimally oriented. All optimism means to me is an optimal chance for optimal behavior for, and optimal results. That's all optimism means. It's nothing fancy, no happy endings. Huh? But if you have optimal behavior, then you have an optimal chance for an optimal result. You people are good examples. You go out and do things. As a result of that, something's got to happen. So that's where the way I look at the future. And I think we have to encourage all all of us to do things, eh? not talk about them, but do them.
As long as the dreamers still have the strength and... I have much scarier things than that around my place. Uh, my wife, my mother-in-law, my children. <laughs> I love children uh, if they're properly cooked. <laughs> Five thousand members. I have much scarier things than that around my place. Uh, my wife, my mother-in-law, my children. <laughs> I love children uh, if they're properly cooked. Five thousand members of KQED. Video West looks at the dreams and the dreamers of science fiction. We'll talk to Robert Silverberg, Fritz Lieber, and Ray Bradbury about their work and see how some speculative views have been incorporated into our popular culture through the medium of the science fiction film. The director of The Day the Earth Stood Still, Robert Wise, will share his insights on how Hollywood has entered outer space, and Gene Roddenberry will reflect on the alternate worlds he created in Star Trek. Later, we'll also see how the world of super technology has turned some of the dreams of science fiction into a practical and occasionally frightening reality, as Video West looks at the images and the imagination of science fiction. He's been an animal who looked beyond his cave, his farm, and his home into the endless possibilities of what might be. It took the wedding of technology to those dreams to create the literature of science fiction. And during the late 1800s, that marriage produced classic extrapolations of what might happen when imagination became reality. Stars. Although bearing little resemblance to the flashy science fiction spacecraft, our own shuttle is the first big chance to get out of this planet and may be the key to human migration in outer space. If space triggers your imagination as much as it has the creators of science fiction and you can't wait for your turn on the shuttle, you might try, like Robert Three, Truax, to two, outsmart NASA one. and go for the Ignition. stars on your own. There she goes. It may be 500 years, it may be 100, only 100 years from now, but I predict that uh, one day there'll be more people living in space than are living on Earth. It's going to be a good place to live. Science fiction writers have conceived of every possible type of alien life form, from creepy monsters to trendy superheroes and just plain old humanoids with large...